Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture, and today our topic is the Missional Church. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director of the Howard G. Hendricks Center for Christian Leadership and Cultural Engagement, and with me today is Alan Hirsch, who actually is a friend who I've run across in ministry over well over a decade. I remember the first time we met was at a Chosen People board meeting, yeah. um, which you came in with your brother who uh, runs Celebrate Messiah. But let's talk about you. You've written several books. Uh, we're going to be discussing On the Verge today that deal with uh, the missional church, and particularly churches that that are having to adjust to a more missional outreach. Uh, Alan is on the adjunct faculty at Wheaton College as well as at Fuller Seminary. He uh, leads a series of works uh, called the Ford Series for InterVarsity Press, well known in dealing with the missional church, and it really is our pleasure to have you with yeah, us Yeah, it's great today. to be with you, bro. Yeah. It wasn't that long ago when we were sitting in uh, Melbourne, Australia. I know, it's you amazing. Know. You know, we, yeah. we meet in all these exotic places, yeah. you know, the coffee shop in Melbourne and then yeah. here at Dallas Seminary. Suffering for Jesus. Huh? <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Alan has started a ministry that is centered in, in Los Angeles, is that right? You yes. moved to LA? Well, uh, yeah, the ministry actually is more uh, centered, uh, or uh, the idea is to kind of focus on the on the American context, but uh, we live in LA now, so mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It's, uh, but really we have hubs all around the country, the Forge hubs. So. We still understand your English, so that works. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let's just dive in. Um, I noticed that in the book Verge you talked about four steps. Imagine shift, which obviously brings in the idea of changing, move and innovate. And everything you write says basically to think fresh, to, mm -hmm. to think in fresh ways, to be willing to change. And so two questions, why is change so important for the church? And then secondly, what doesn't change? Yeah, um, yeah why is change important for the church? Well, in a sense, um, uh, I think the, the short answer to that is that what I think what has got us to this point in history, I don't believe is going to get us much further. Uh, we pretty much have operated out of a, an understanding of the church that comes from the European experience, uh, primarily seeing ourselves uh, uh, within a, what I call institutional paradigm, uh, and that paradigm has ruled pretty much how uh, the church is engaged in the West for, uh, well, 17 centuries or so. But as we now engage a, a much more seriously non-churched, unchurched, and an increasingly de-churched uh, context, we need to adopt a missionary stance in relationship to our context, and that necessitates change, because um, our method. Well, I mean, the church in America is uh, all indicators statistically is that it is in decline, and it's systematic and it's trended. So uh, it, it's clear that I think what has got us to this point, uh, I don't think, is going to get us further. Having said that, clearly they, you know, we're still the church, and the, you know, the elements, uh, how we draw ourselves, our identity from Scripture, from our understanding of, of God, and our particular understanding of who Jesus is, and that which we carry. Um, I think it's more like going back to our original message uh, and, um, and, and, and trying to rediscover it again. Uh, and in, in a sense, that all I'm doing in, in my, my works is what in, in the reformed circles we call Semper Reformanda, mm -hmm. which is the church reformed mm -hmm. always to be reforming according to the Word of God. Right. So we, we're looking at uh, uh, the church and we're looking with the Word of God in, our, in the other hand. We're saying, is there still stuff to be learned here about how we can be God's people more effectively than we are now? Now, uh, most people are aware that the situation in Europe and the situation in Australia and New Zealand is obviously a much, uh, the, the Christian church is a much more uh, constricted uh, yeah. impact in society. Not f many fewer people attend church, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. How much of your perception has been fueled by the experience that you came to the States with where mm -hmm. you watched this happen to mm -hmm. the church. In, yeah, in many ways, uh, like I, I say to people that uh, we've seen the uh, decentering of the church, we've experienced it in the Australian context. Uh, we now, in terms of the biblical Christianity, what we'd say the broad evangelicals, charismatics, evangelicals, Pentecostals, um, 
uh, self-define uh, themselves in our census about 2.9% of our population. Mm. Um, I mean, that's relatively insignificant in, in statistical terms. Um, the European experience is very similar. In Germany, they, that same statistic is around about 2%. Mm-hmm. And that's where we got our understanding of the church from in the first place, uh, primarily anyway. Um, so I, I feel like it's kind of like a... I'm from, in one way, I'm from the future mm-hmm. of the Western church in America if something doesn't change. Mm-hmm. And I, I do believe I, I've been sent here by God. I do feel it is a great sense of call uh, to... Um, and on the understanding that we, if as far as the church in the West is concerned, Daryl, uh, it seems to me that we win or lose it here in, in the States. Uh, if we don't turn the ship around here, I don't think it's going to come from Europe. They've had it for 17 centuries or 20 centuries of, uh, mm-hmm. of it, and uh, it, it, it really has ended up as a bus, bus crash, you know. Um, so it, it has to be turned around here. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I feel like I've been called to kind of serve the American church. Yeah, I, I, I have a very much similar feel and experience. I've done three sabbatical, four sabbaticals in Germany and yeah. then spent three years in Scotland doing doctor work. So seven years of my adult mm-hmm. life have been spent in Europe, and I've seen what Europe it's is. devastated. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I always felt like I said to people, people would ask me, why do you go on sabbatical in Europe? I said, because I want to see kind of where – things are headed and think about how to avoid yeah. going there. Yeah. So I, I say to people, like, if Americans kind of doubt that, all you need to look at the real population centers in America. So you look at New York City mm-hmm. and the whole eastern seaboard, the western seaboard as well, mm-hmm. uh, somewhat different in L.A., but certainly as you move up towards the, uh, the north, there's no doubt about it that uh, the church is increasingly taken out of its privileged position and pushed to the margins. Uh, this is equally true of what's happening in Chicago and other parts of the Midwest where the populations are. It's definitely the trend. Now, America's different. It's not going to be European secularity, mm-hmm. but, it's, um, but the logic of Western civilization, I think, is Europe. Mm-hmm. The logic there is that the church uh, 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 is is going to be forced into a marginal situation where it becomes one of the voices among many in a pluralist society. Yes. And, and that's a different place to stand, and we need to learn how to witness to what we stand for from within that context. Yeah, I often say that, that our culture is shifting from a place where the Bible was seen as an answer to the Bible being the question. Mm-hmm. And so being able to get even to the, the content of the Bible is, is a is – a, it is an important step for people who are leaders yeah. in the church to know how to take. And many are not trained to go yes. there because they were used to having this privileged yeah. position and assuming they could say the Bible says and, and they would immediately yes. have credibility. Yeah. That's yeah. all changing. Yeah, it's all changing and, uh, um, and fast. Uh, the thing is in America, in my understanding, I love this country, um, uh, ideas adopted very quickly. Mm-hmm. So again, that, that uh, leaning into the future, mm-hmm. openness to possibility, and that's the wonderful side of the American context but uh, uh, ideas are dropped equally as quickly so decline when it happens I think will come very very fast and become shockingly fast so if you listen to uh, um, uh, Barna's book I mean Barna no longer heads up his uh, organization but when he wrote Revolution uh, it might be an overstatement but the logic is there the trend is set he says that by 2025 the church will have halved uh, its attendance and he was writing in 2005 so half the attendance of what they had in 20 years. So I don't know if that's true or not, but it's definitely the trend is there, and so we need to be prepared for it. Yeah. Well, uh, I asked you, you've explained why change is necessary. Let's do the other half. What doesn't change? Why, how, do we, how, do we, how do we change, if I can say it this way, how do we change without changing right. that which is important? Yeah, so, so for me, actually, the answer is actually going back beyond uh, the Western derivatives, the European derivative, to our m- most fundamental message which is the scriptures. So for me, um, my most fundamental, and I think God had bugged me with this, and, and my calling was to actually try and get under the hood of what's happening in the, in the early church. Now, mm-hmm. uh, how does it grow from 25,000 year 100, that's Stark's figure, mm-hmm. uh, to upwards to 20 million around about 300, so mm-hmm. t- 200 years later? How does it hit that kind of exponential high impact? That's real church growth. I mean, that's huge. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. they don't have everything that we normally that's associate with. Right. So they didn't have you know, the Bible actually being, it was being put together. That's right. Uh, they didn't have uh, seeker-sensitive buildings. They, didn't, they were illegal. They mm-hmm. were persecuted at times severely. Uh, they didn't have podcasts. <laughs> they didn't have all the stuff <laughs> we, we ordinarily think you need to build a church, and yet they grow. So for me, 
I wanted to really get back under there. And mm-hmm. I think the logic of that is New Testament ecclesiology or the New Testament understanding of the church. So I think the answer, our greatest answers are remembered. They're not new. Mm-hmm. This is not novelty. Mm-hmm. It's actually going back to our most fundamental uh, phenomenon of ecclesiology, which is like the New Testament. So we're going back to try and discover that nature of the movement of God that we see in 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 the new page of the New Testament. Yeah, what strikes me in reading the material that that you've worked with is, is that we are going back to this kind of core dynamic community that is much more open-ended in the way it yeah. operates and is structured than the way we normally yeah. think of church with its structures and departments yes. and that kind That's of right. thing. And so the, the general feel that you have is it's a much more interactive, much more responsive kind of yeah. organism yeah. than, than uh, an institution yeah. or a business that's delivering a product. Yeah, absolutely. So when you look at it, it's, uh, I mean, the way, if I had to do a quick description, I think it's a group of people that really hanging out with Jesus, mm-hmm. so they, that we say that Jesus is absolutely core, and the, and the, the 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 core motto is Jesus is Lord, which carries, as you know, a huge amount of weight. That's it's right. A, it's a worldview in in three words. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a discipleship ethos. There's a strong commitment to following Him and becoming more like Him, and, in, mm-hmm. and letting He embody the faith in, in significant ways. There's a commitment to extend the mission through what we say missional sentness and then going down deep into culture, so in, in contextualizing it. Uh, there is a there's a, a kind of a, a ministry that is commensurate to the task, so that we say if you want a missional church, you have to have a missional ministry for it. And then we, I would say that the biggest clue to that is the Ephesians 4 text. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we might talk about that later. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, it organizes differently. They, it's a movement, so it's decentered. It's a people movement. Everyone gets to play. It's it's uh, it's quite a rem- remarkable phenomenon. They didn't have internet too, yeah. and yet they held together. So they yeah. had a common identity, but they were flourishing, and then they, they have an adventuresome nature about them that they flourish in the midst of severe trial at times. You know, so there's something about that that we need to recover in our day. No, that's yeah. that, that's well put. Well, yeah. let, let's let's go through the elements here. I'm gonna for people who aren't familiar with your work, I'm gonna I'm gonna deal with the elements by just laying them out and quickly describing them. And if I if I misstep, do do correct me. But the, what you call apostolic genius is the idea, first of all, that Jesus is Lord, kind of the theological center and worldview yeah. hub, if you yeah. will, of what's going on. Um, there's disciple making, which you use the synonym oftentimes apprenticeship, which I think mm-hmm. is a nice way to think about mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's the missional incarnational impulse. This is the drive to, to move out, I think, and make other other people, like-minded people Mm -hmm. in in what you do. Um, The apostolic environment, which is the idea that there are gifts and enablements that are spread across the entirety of the body, Mm -hmm. if I can say it that Mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Um, And then finally, uh, well, not finally, then there's organic systems, thinking about the decentralization of what that dynamic Mm -hmm. requires. And then finally, there's uh, communitas, which is community, uh, intense community, real community, which uh, when we get to, we'll have to talk about because the American culture is so individualized, mm-hmm. building community mm-hmm. is very, very difficult. So there are six elements here, and what's interesting is, is that you say that Jesus is, uh, is Lord, is at the hub of what you discuss. Everything else you say other movements have, and I really got caught by the fact that you compared it to uh, communist China, yeah. <laughs> and not the normal uh, combination that I normally don't put church and communist China next to one another in thinking about how sociologically movements work. But the point you're making is they make disciples. Um, they get everybody involved. There's a missional impulse in reaching out. There obviously are organic systems. Mm. I'm not sure how decentralized necessarily it is, but there's mm. an organic system that makes it work. And there's an attempt to build a sense, at least, of uh, of community. So your point is, everything else that drives major movements, mm. even something like coming out of communist China, you will see in other movements, but what makes this movement unique is Jesus as Lord being yes. at the center. Yeah. So how, how does that um, – how, what is that – you call, call it the Jesus vibe. What is that in yeah. your thinking? Well, it's interesting. Yeah. I think uh, um, – it's a correction. I think, I'm, I, I think I refer to Al-Qaeda even shockingly. Okay. <laughs> uh, because if you look at it, it it's what we say is, is – you know the term phenomenology. Right. It's the interrelationship that things have with each other mm-hmm. um, and the study of how things come together to inform each other and mm-hmm. create a phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at Al-Qaeda, which is a shocking uh, comparison, um, other than the center, which of course is the 
that sets the whole vibe for it because at the, at the core of jihadism, of course, is the notion of a very militant understanding of Allah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, but the rest of it, the capacity to, as you say, make disciples mm-hmm. or to kind of transfer the message one to one, you know, the, the, the kind of the mission, the sense of called and sentness, uh, calling to do their job, and they, they'll do it one way or another. That's right. Uh, you know, the, all those elements begin to play. And that's a shocking thing because actually I think, and yet it's maybe wonderful because if you look at all movements, actually this applies to what we say the orders of creation, mm-hmm. not just the orders of redemption. It's not just true of the church. It's true of all people movements. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the phenomenon of movement. And what changes the game is Jesus. Um, uh, it, it's a total game changer because the founder, uh, the, what he represents, uh, um, uh, his, his teachings and his, uh, what he embodies and what he calls us to actually begins to permeate through the whole. The rest is just kind of means of spreading it. And uh, uh, yeah, so it, it does. Uh, Jesus is a, the game changer, honestly. Um, it's interesting uh, on this point. I mean, if you, you, you see the role of founders have in, 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 the, in the, the religion. So if mm-hmm. you say Judaism, well, debatable Abraham Moses, right? Mm-hmm. But even you say even the combination there, it's interesting to track the religion mm-hmm. that follows Abraham Moses. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you just take Abraham out, it's got a very different feel again. Mm-hmm. You just put you know, Abraham put and Torah Abraham. in there and yeah, you Torah, got a good feel. Right. Yeah. It's a different feel. So yeah. you, but it's, say, with... Uh, with um, 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 B- Buddhism, right? Mm-hmm. It detracts back from Buddha. Mm-hmm. So what what you say is the Buddha here sets the agenda for the movement that mm-hmm. comes, claims his name, and the same would be true of Confucius. Uh, but certainly, you can see in the case of Islam, uh, the founder sets the tone of the movement that claims the name. Mm-hmm. Uh, he defines the way it should shape itself. So the founders play very very critical roles, and for us, Jesus changes the changes everything. Yeah, and one difference that I often talk about with students is is that you know you can have Confucius or Buddha or or Muhammad. They are guides. They point the way to God in one sense or another. But what's unique about what Jesus is claiming is he's at the center of what's happening. Yeah. I mean, it isn't I'm going to tell you what the teaching is and you follow it. No, yeah. there's a personal dimension involving yeah. him and who he is. And then trying to replicate who he is, that's yeah. very central. It's what's pretty going radical, on. isn't it? I mean, it's like uh, I, I think it was uh, it's one Anglican archbishop who said, I can't remember his name right now, he said that it's not so much that Jesus is like God, and that's true enough, mm-hmm. but that God is like Christ. Yes. And in him, there is no own Christ likeness at all, right? So, um, so how do we know this? Well, in, in, in John, of course, Jesus mm-hmm. said, you know, to, uh, uh, Andrew says, Show me the Father. Show that's us the right. Father. He says, Dude. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so right. You've been with me and yeah. you don't get it? You don't get it? <laughs> yeah. If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. And he says elsewhere, I and the Father are one. And I think that's quite a strong claim. Yeah, I think it's yeah. interesting. You know, we're made in God's image, but there's a sense in which God has imaged himself in yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And, and so we get, we, get, yeah. we get the model in the mirror yeah. uh, incarnated that v- yeah. that's very different than everything yeah, else. Yeah, absolutely right. So the, we say like uh, this when it comes to the incarnational mission stuff, which we mentioned there, mm-hmm. it's interesting how the idea of the incarnation uh, that God would become one of us mm-hmm. uh, should, you know, it it is uh, what what uh, what Lewis rightly calls the grand miracle. It's mm-hmm. the miracle behind all the other ones. Mm-hmm. It 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 it, it's, um, it is absolutely foundational. And for us evangelicals, we very very seldom pay attention to it. And it really is an yeah. offense to uh, other uh, monothe- monotheistic yeah. religions. I mean, uh, classic Judaism reacts to the idea that God could take on flesh, and certainly Islam reacts. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, I get emails regularly where I'm interacting with people who are Muslim in background, and their their communication to me, you mean God sleeps, he goes to the bathroom? You know, they, yeah. very, they put it in very crass terms to try and drive yeah. the point home how offended they are that and the idea that a, God could take on humanity. It is. Yes, that's he right. Did. <laughs> exactly. That's the point. So, um, well, that that's that, that's step one. Let's let's talk about um, let's talk about uh, discipleship, and uh, I'd like for you to contrast formation as you see it normally happening, in the apprenticeship you call disciple making. Um, or perhaps uh, the contrast between what you call genuine discipleship and mere church attendance. Um, how is disciple? How is disciple making more than simply mastering content? That's mm. what I'm really driving oh, yeah. after. I mean, it's a huge issue, isn't it? I think uh, how we define dis- discipleship, I think, matters hugely. And it's interesting, Daryl, because I mean, I get often asked the question, um, "Well, how do we do it?" Right? So, mm-hmm. um, and I find that 
quite remarkable because of all the things we've handed down over history, right? <laughs> right. We've got to do, we do some quirky that's stuff, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. I mean, those are the things we and we've kind of been what. doing discipleship for a while, right? Yeah. You would think that we'd have <laughs> yeah, this down. That's of, right. Of all the traditions that we would have mastered, actually, mm-hmm. over 2,000 years of Christian history, we would have mastered discipleship. We still don't know how to do it. And I think it really it's possibly quite possibly the most important thing you know, in terms of how we, the church actually engages. That's God, right. Because um, you can't do anything yeah. else without it. So here's the thing. I mean, so my definition is not not particularly highfalutin, as you say here uh-huh. in Texas. Um, <laughs> uh, it is simply becoming more and more like Christ. So mm-hmm. it is in, in the image of God. In the, you know, the image of God in in Jesus, or it becomes the image of man. So like we we become more like Him. So imitation of Christ. But then He's Christ's life in me. So. It's very much a formation in Christ, mm-hmm. and um, so to become like Jesus, we must become uh, little Jesus, and um, that, it's kind of quite a simple definition, but it, it actually changes the game again. It's not simply understanding information about him. It's actually being formed so that I become more and more and more like him. I should be more like him this year than I was last year, and, and next year I should be more like him again, and the church's job is to hold me accountable to that. And we hold each other accountable to that. Uh, it seems to me that this is how Jesus gets into his church. And his ethos actually is embedded into his community. And one of the things that I sense from the reading is is that you talk about that happening not in the context of kind of four walls of a classroom, but it's really got to be connected to life, the yes. way we live, the way we engage, where we are. And so the disciple making, in, in fact, in the last part of the book where there are models of the way in which churches are missional, part of the point, it seems to me, is almost as if it's driving people out of the pew, Mm -hmm. if I can say it that way, and into the world so they can be and reflect Christ where they are Mm -hmm. and also where God can Mm -hmm. teach them how to do that in the Mm -hmm. midst of the world. Mm -hmm. Is it fair? Absolutely. You're right. I think part of us, I I think we are very, very um, attached to a Western or a particularly Hellenistic understanding of of knowledge, Mm -hmm. that if you get the idea, you have it. and. Mm Well, you, it changes you, and I'm afraid that doesn't it doesn't work like that. And the Hebraic, well, we both Hebrews, right? That's right. Um, <laughs> um, so the, in the Hebraic understanding, and I follow the, the Shema here as a kind of good clue to what we call uh, a, a biblical epistemology. How do we know if something's true or not? Uh, I think uh, the heart that is we, that I, there's a heart knowledge that cannot be gained by the head. Mm-hmm. There's a head knowledge you mm-hmm. should love the, with all your mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the the mind can understand things that the heart cannot. Mm-hmm. But then there's obedience, uh, which is the will, uh, mm-hmm. or our bodies, or our hands, uh, and obedience delivers a knowledge of God that cannot be. A, obtained by any other So means. you learn on the job, so to speak. Yeah. And it's the combination of all three mm-hmm. actually come together to create a, what, uh, right at the center of those three it's intersecting circles. Uh, I think that's where discipleship is delivered. It's kind of heart, head, and hand, and it's not one to the exclusion of the other. It's all three engaging each other. So a church that simply huddles and gathers really can't can't get there in no. some ways. No, because it's, it's disobedient. And, and, and uh, we in the West, and I think uh, Dallas Willard, uh, who, who died recently, mm-hmm. and a great honor to him, uh, he would say that we were educated beyond our capacity to obey. Mm-hmm. And I think that's pretty true. We know more in our heads than we do in our lives, mm-hmm. and yet our lives communicate our message. Yeah, if we applied half of what we knew, we yeah. might be better off. Yeah, indeed. So, yeah. so if you use the fancy words for this, we'd say like um, it's ortho. Doxy, which is a, is right belief, right. orthopraxy, which is right behavior, mm-hmm. and orthopathy, which of course Jonathan Edwards was mm-hmm. about and all that, you know, um, the right sense of passion or bringing our hearts to God and learning to emotively… The right emotion, yeah. Putting our, you know, our emotive life, yeah. uh, and, and we are motivated through emotion, right? and um, Edwards understood that pretty well. Actually. So if you segregate those things, the danger is, is you actually end up being disconnected and in, out of balance. Yeah. 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 Well, um, let's talk about uh, mission a little bit, um, uh, and I want you to talk about how you think mission has been marginalized in the church and how we get it back into its rightful place. And in asking this question, I have in mind the diagram that you had where mission goes from being a department in the church, kind of set off over here mm-hmm. with other things happening, mm-hmm. to the idea of mission being at kind of the top of the diagram and feeding everything else the church is doing. Mm-hmm. So uh, with that kind of picture and background, how, how is uh, – and you at one point you make this statement, mission with Without Jesus is a terrible Lord, which I think is an interesting expression, an interesting picture. So I'm assuming that what you mean by that is that mission is a task mm-hmm. of some kind or an assignment or a, th- a thing I accomplish, mm-hmm. as opposed to being a love, an exp- 
expression of love and an expression of Jesus in his presence, actually engaging people with trying to model and reflect who, who Jesus is. So when you say that the church follows mission, um, what does that mean in terms of culture and engagement? Right. He, he doesn't ask the easy question. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so uh, I think this is actually a huge paradigm shift for the church in the West. For for so long, we have managed to uh, pretty much eject uh, mission from our consciousness. Um, I mean, I've read pretty much. I'm pretty sure I write on this that Calvin's Institutes. I read cover to cover. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't mention mission once. It doesn't feature in his thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's something about uh, reaching the the uh, Islam, Islam, but it's it's hardly in terms of what we would see as cross cultural mission today. Mm-hmm. And um, so it doesn't feature in his his thinking about the church. Mm-hmm. So the church is uh, basically assumes that everyone is Christian. It's mm-hmm. just what kind of Christian are you? Calvinist or you Lutheran or mm-hmm. you know are you uh, are you um, a Roman Catholic? Um, and pretty much that has marked our understanding of things for a long, long time. So the way we've formed our understanding of the church is basically ejected mission. Mission becomes a subcommittee. Right. Uh, and I think research indicates about 2% of people could care less. Uh-huh. And uh, it's usually concerned with overseas. Mm-hmm. And with the Great Revo- Revolution, and I think this was um, something that was the 20th century rediscovery, uh, increasingly Karl Barth and others began to kind of talk about the Missio Dei, mm-hmm. which of course began to say that, no, actually maybe mission's not external to God, it's intri- intrinsic to who he is, mm-hmm. right? So It's kind of in the Great Commission. It's in the Great Commission, <laughs> yeah. but it's actually part of who God is. So exactly. It's saying uh, we've made it the doc- uh, f- a function of the church. Actually, right. we say God sent the Son. The word sent, of course, is Missio, right. where we get our word mission from. It's a missile, you see. <laughs> right? um, so, so we're saying that God sent the Son. The son is both sent and sending. Mm-hmm. So the son, father, and the son, so the the son participates, or the father participates in the son's sentness, and then they together send the spirit. The mm-hmm. send, we discovered the spirit is sent. He's mm-hmm. also a missionary, and then he says, "As the father sent me, so I send you." So we said, actually, we're all sent. Uh, so we say that. That sentness is intrinsic to God. It's part of the doctrine of God. It's even as far back as Abraham. I mean, yeah. Abraham is sent to go to a land, and the whole point right. of gathering a people is so that there's a people who can exemplify yeah. to the rest of the world, and they're That's supposed right. to be sent as well yeah. to impact the yeah. world. And of course, the Messiah yeah. comes through that. So um, it, it's literally through the whole. So, so the point you're making here is that is that rather than the church being something that defines mission, mission is something that defines, defines what the church, the church is. Yeah. And very practically, it means this is that we don't uh, front load our ecclesiology, our understanding of the church when we engage in culture, mm-hmm. particularly with un, you know, non-Christian people, because then we'll simply impose our understanding or our cultural expression. Mm-hmm. This is what the Jews try to do mm-hmm. in Jerusalem upon the Galatian people. Mm-hmm. This is the incarnational impulse at work, mm-hmm. which is connected with it. Uh, what Paul would argue then, in missiologically reading the book of Galatians, he would say this, is that that actually the Galatians have a right to follow Jesus in ways that are Galatian mm-hmm. and consistent with their own culture. Mm-hmm. They don't have to become Jews in order to follow Jesus. Mm-hmm. And we defend that as the right of every people to have a church or a community of faith that is consistent with their own culture. When we front load our ecclesiology, we impose our forms of culture, assuming that they are normative for everyone. Mm-hmm. And we pretty much have done that. Over mm-hmm. time. So when we say, you know, mission precedes the church, it's simply saying, you go in among a group of people, and once you're there, and you can only really answer it truly once you're there, mm-hmm. you ask, what is community, what is church for this people group? Mm-hmm. And then you articulate it into the community. And so that's why there's a variety of forms that we see in the New Testament, because yeah. there isn't this imposition that's of right. one size fits all. That's right. uh, you've made an observation that I think is huge that I don't want to let slip away. It's a sociological observation that's important, and it has to do with, with uh, the way Calvin didn't approach and discuss mission. And I think that what's going on here, and I think this is important to understand. And he's just one of them. Of he, course, yeah, right? but it's a great example. He lived in the middle of Europe in which the in which the culture was driven very much by a Judeo-Christian, what I'll call veneer. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, uh, and the assumption was at the culture, at the largest levels, that this is the way society ought to be. It ought to have this dimension in it. One of the things that scares me about what we're doing today, even as we move back to the reformers and look to them, which is a healthy thing to do, is that 
that world and that assumption it is, no doesn't right. exist anymore. And that's why change is so necessary. That's right. Yeah. And so if you fail to see that and you simply go back to the reformers, you will go back and go backwards yeah. as opposed to going forward. Yes. You've got to realize how the context around you yeah. has changed. It's yeah. not the same one that Calvin yeah. addressed. Yeah. Yes. So uh, we call this, uh, I don't think it's in On the Verge, but I call it in other books a radical traditionalism. Mm-hmm. That is... Uh, all organizations, this is following Max Weber's idea, mm-hmm. that you return to your founding ethos, rediscover it, and reinterpret it for your context. Mm-hmm. So, like the Beatle, for instance, mm-hmm. where uh, it disappears, the, the Volkswagen Beatle, well, kind of the end of the 70s, mm-hmm. early 80s, I don't know, it pops up again in the middle of the 90s. Mm-hmm. And say, is it a Beatle? Oh, uh, yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> it's a different one. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, so what they did is actually they, they picked up what was core to what they want about and they reinterpret it now that's important for organizations mm-hmm. but in times of radical shift mm-hmm. like we're experiencing now where the church is increasingly and and fundamentally being marginalized from the center which i think is a good thing personally mm-hmm. um, uh, we need to go far more radical uh, than simply the the founders of our organizations we go back to our founder capital f mm-hmm. and i call this not reformation but refounding mm-hmm. our, our founder must be found in us and in other words this is the re-Jesus factor. We mm-hmm. go back to Jesus, uh, and, and we calibrate back to him. We re- reboot uh, uh, the system back to here. So we make sure that we are consistent with who Jesus is, and then rebuild again from there. And I think we do this again and again. And the danger is is that we might try and recalibrate Jesus, but if we recalibrate Jesus with the, with the reformers or any period as – as really the driving force, you really don't end up recalibrating yeah. back to Jesus. That's right. We recalibrate, <laughs> Je- we recalibrate Jesus to be like us. That's it? right. I think it was Voltaire who said that uh, God made us in his image and we ret- returned the favor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he, ends up, he ends up looking like us. Yeah, it's, a, it's an important point, and, and I think that sometimes people don't get it, and because they don't get it, then they, they end up landing in the wrong place when they go to make change. Yeah. Because they think that the best way to go change is to make change is to simply go back. Yeah. And, and that usually um, isn't going to do it. Well, let me, let me shift again here and talk about apostolic genius a little bit. We've gone through the pieces, Jesus is Lord, disciple-making, missional incarnational impulse, apostolic environment, organic systems, really emphasizing decentralization, communitas. Most of these make instant sense, it seems to me, but the one that I think people might struggle with getting their hands around and understanding that really does seem to be important in what you're saying is the idea of apostolic environment. What exactly is that, and how does Ephesians 4, 7 to 11 uh, fit into that apostolic environment? And uh, is, I'm gonna, my simple way of saying this is, is it multi-gifted players, people People being gifted differently, side by side, all in the game. I mean, right. is that kind of the way to think about That's it? That's certainly a way to think about it. But I think what what I would um, I'd like to suggest is something. This is interesting, and I can, mm-hmm. if I may, spend just a little more okay, time sure. on this because I think it's very important. It's interesting here. We have a major piece of Pauline doctrine, right? So mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a huge slab of scripture mm-hmm. uh, in what we might say is the constitutional, uh, at least Paul's constitutional document of the church. Mm-hmm. It's Paul's best thinking mm-hmm. about what he thinks about the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, now you're talking uh, about the book of Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians, yeah, of course, yes. Yeah. Uh, it's a Magna Carta. Um, right. And we've always treated it as such, and That's we right. should. Um, it's a very important book. Um, and and so he's addressing all God's people, and, and they were just house churches. Mm-hmm. They weren't a, a seminary like this today, That's or right. probably the people watching this. It was a, a regional people young converts more or less you know they weren't really meeting at home 75 50 to yeah, 75 yeah, at a pop right. that's right yeah and there yeah. might have been 20 across the city right yeah, and they would yeah. hand the the, the the book around from uh, church to church and yeah. they would read it out so uh, the people receiving this truth are just the people of God nothing mm-hmm. fancy about them at all right mm-hmm. and here you get in in verses 1 to 6 you get you know the one Lord one faith one faith one baptism one God and Father mm-hmm. us all is Lord of all um, this is a, a, f- a confessional basis it's monotheistic and we find our identity in the one God all people will affirm that is uh, true of all time mm-hmm. uh, then we go to the uh, what I call apest uh, um, that uh, he has given some to be uh, it, in fact, he says in verse 7, it was he who gave some to be, an aorist indicative. Mm-hmm. Uh, he gave some to be, a very strong verb, mm-hmm. uh, um, uh, to each one of us, uh, custos, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so here's Jesus cutting the cake and he's dishing out the goodies, right? Mm-hmm. And it goes on through the ascension, giftings and all that. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, 
uh, evangelist shepherds and teachers, mm-hmm. right? And then it goes on to say, uh, in verses 12 to 16, it says, so that you might mature, mm-hmm. so you might be built up and uh, no longer be tossed around by every wind of doctrine, yeah? Not whimsical. Each part connected to the other and each to the so there's no Christ. way it happens unless everybody's connected to everybody. That's right. So, yeah. so what we've generally tended to do is that we've taken, yes, we believe in the first section, we believe mm-hmm. in the last section, that describes the church as we should, but we've messed around with that middle piece, right? <laughs> and I want to say it as yeah. a missional thing, not, yeah, I'm not right, talking right. about charismatic gift. I think right. it's the functions of the church or it's the ministry of God's people and it distributes out mm-hmm. in fivefold form. Uh, uh, we can say Jesus, uh, and I think this is the kicker for me because we say that Jesus is an apostle. Yeah, you know, he was founds a religion. He's the sent mm-hmm. one. Sentness is the mm-hmm. same word as apostello. Yeah, mi- so, missio, exactly. Same. Yes. So, uh, pro- a prophet is he a prophet? Mm, yeah, I guess he's a prophet. Yeah, very much. So, right? <laughs> Evangelist. Yeah, yeah. He's the, he is the good news. Right? Yeah. Uh, is he is he a shepherd? He is called the good shepherd. Yeah. Right? Uh, is he a teacher? No brainer. <laughs> yeah, so actually, right. Jesus' ministry can be seen as fivefold form. And mm-hmm. here, the beauty of this image, of this this passage, is that. The ministry of Christ expressing itself through the body of Christ, and mm-hmm. it prisms out in fivefold form throughout his people. Mm-hmm. And I think that if we want to be the church Jesus intended, we cannot simply do it on a shepherd-teacher model, mm-hmm. which is what we've done. Mm-hmm. Now, here's, a, for me, the, what got me. When you look at movements that change the world, remember, that's where I started. Mm-hmm. How do you grow from, you know, from 25,000 to 20 million? Right. In every case, and I make this as a categorical statement, every case that I can tell, there's never been a movement that went into exponential growth that didn't have at least a fivefold ministry a operative. Hmm. Doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. So it seems to me an absolutely foundational aspect of the ministry of, of the church. If you want missional church, you have to have a missional ministry to go with it. And uh, it, that, I think, has to be at least fivefold form and distributed among the people of God. Um, so, so not centralized in one person or not centralized yeah. in, a, in a select group, but really the, like the community being active. Yes, so, uh, but it might, some people might embody it better than others. So I right, say it this way, um, you might say, uh, are we all called to the sentness of, of the church or the apostolicity of the church, the apostolate? Yes. We all participate in that, but some of us are set aside to actually good, are good at it and called to actually guide that peace. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're all called the prophetic of all believers. Prophets guard the relationship between God. Uh, they're covenant people. They maintain that kind of relationship that God has with his people and represent him. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, don't care much what you think about things. So yeah. They care more than what God said. Yeah. Some people, we're all called to do that, mm-hmm. but some of us do it better than others. So mm-hmm. Some of us embody that ministry better than others. We're all called to share faith. We're all called to be evangelists, mm-hmm. but some of us suck at it mm-hmm. uh, yeah. or, or um, uh, some of us are better than others and they're the evangelists and so, so on we're all called to care but we some of us are pastors we're all called to teach in some way but all some of us are teachers and so you can see it as the functions of the church but that really how people embody it different, differently so some, some I think uh, I don't believe in the offices I think it's not the term I would use but I think there are vocations there mm-hmm. there's something about it um, that, that, is, uh, that defines who we are so that that's the core example. Of course, if we were to go to the other uh, passages where where giftedness is lift uh, is listed, and we talk about what the Spirit has given to the church, there are additional roles that yes. people perform that fill out the community yeah. and make it dynamic yes. and make it able to respond. Yes. And but those five you're saying are really are, are driving because they 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 really do focus, don't they, on the on the way the church uh, interacts. With the culture that yes. it's sent to. Yes, and so uh, two Jewish geeks here. So, right, okay, right. Right. so let's uh, let's play the geek thinking. <laughs> so um, uh, I think that the way is that the word uh, "strife" of the calling you have received is a hint of what Paul is aiming at in Ephesians. So, and then is there's a, there's a to be a call to be, which is an indicative. Mm-hmm. So I think there's something more about our identity at play mm-hmm. in Ephesians four. When we see in the one Corinthians passage, for instance, they seem it's manifestations of the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. not the gifts of Jesus, mm-hmm. and it seems that those come and go. I mean, they yeah, they and that's driven us. by the nature of the problem that he's yeah, discussing yeah. too. That's right. That's crea- yeah, created the I, I, conversation. Absolutely right. Yeah. So yeah. it seems that the Spirit gives that and then yeah. withdraws it. It doesn't yeah. ever become your identity. Mm-hmm. It, so I say, like, a, uh, if I had, a, if I was a carpenter, I have a toolbox. So mm-hmm. Uh, it's certain toolbox. If you look in my toolbox, well, I got a saw, I got a hammer, I got the basic tools. If I was a dentist, I have a different toolbox. Mm-hmm. It seems to me, if I was a, a, a evangelist, my toolbox is different to a teacher's toolbox. Mm-hmm. And I think the charismatic gifts of of uh, uh, Corinthians, for instance, mm-hmm. I think are toolbox gifts. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think um, Ephesians is more vocational. It's your core. identity. Their core, yeah, yeah. core. It's the way I'm trying to explain. Okay. It. 
Good. That helps us. Now let's talk about activating latent potential because obviously part of what you're dealing with is Jesus has given these gifts and enablements. What I, 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 when I think of giftedness or the roles of the church, I like to talk about enablements. I like to talk. I like to use Paul's word in Romans that we have the power to walk with God and be who God has created us mm -hmm. to be. So we're thinking about empowerment, but we're also thinking about a potential that's kind of latent. Uh, uh, you know, it's there, but but using yeah. it and getting to yeah, it and yeah. making it work is a whole different deal. Yeah. So uh, I sense that you see the church as kind of a, a if I can, a smoldering entity. I, when I was originally thinking of this, I was thinking it's of a, a volcano idea. ready to explode. It's, it's a great I thought, image. Man, that's a powerful image, but yeah, it might be a little exactly too destructive. It. Okay. But, um, full of potential to be released, but pent up. Yep, yep. Um, so how does one get to the place where the potential is released? Well, now look at history on this one, right? This is and actually the most foundational. What I really struck me, and for those who might have even bothered to read, uh, say, the shaping things to come, which is a kind mm -hmm. of a somewhat more revolutionary text. Bring it down, you know, because like, <laughs> we needed we were angry young guys, yeah, and, yeah. and we felt urgent. So know? that was the early book. Yeah, it's an early book. Uh -huh. When I began to look at movements, I wanted to get in under you know under the hood of mm -hmm. those boom, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, what really struck me, Daryl, and it changed me fundamentally, is that. What I began to discover is actually Jesus has given us everything we need to get the job done. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to import anything. Jesus designed us Ephesians for world transformation. One, three. You've been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. I didn't even recognize that, but that's true. Yeah. It's yeah. ours. It's yeah, an indicative, yeah, exactly, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. So um, uh, in China, for instance, I mean, China has the church uh, apparently from – from from the early centuries, when uh, with Thomas's mission to the east established small witness goes through other ages, but the church they really get was from the Europeans as they colonize. Mm -hmm. So the biggest church in China at the time of Mao Zedong's revolution was um, the Roman Catholics, a very hierarchical, mm -hmm. uh, very highly centralized, controlled church, and. In Mao Zedong, it's completely obliterated. And in two, three years, and then the Cultural Revolution mm -hmm. later on, I mean, it was obliterated. And some of the most severe persecution we know, uh, people like us, mm -hmm. we're out. The seminary's gone. Like, the seminary yeah. belongs to the state. Mm -hmm. All buildings are confiscated. Uh, missionaries are thrown out. Um, and, and the church is decimated. And all you've got now is a group of peasants. And under the con those conditions, those Chinese peasants, something happens. They grow from 2 million mm -hmm. in year uh, 1950. Mm -hmm. Uh, from what we can tell, the best estimates now about 120 million. This mm -hmm. is 70 years later. Yeah. Now, how do they do that? Mm -hmm. They are deinstitutionalized, so they don't, all the stuff mm -hmm. that we think is needed, all the structure that we yeah. think is necessary. And the only answer, again, from a phenomenological perspective, right. is that it had to have been there already. Mm -hmm. The phenomenon that appears in China is phen phenomenologically precisely the same as the early church. Mm -hmm. There are a few distinctive differences, but they're non-essentials. So the phenomenons are exactly the same. And then I began to look down through all those in history when you see that kaboom. Mm -hmm. And the phenomena is the same. So I call that book The Forgotten Ways mm -hmm. because actually I believe these are our ways. We mm -hmm. forget them. Mm -hmm. They're kind of in the basement or in the attic. Mm -hmm. And all layers and traditions overlay it. And we forget what is essential. The catalytic moment of adapt or die mm -hmm. often catalyzes that change. It doesn't always have to be that way, but mm -hmm. it, uh, in the case of so you're the saying sometimes it takes a real crisis for us to rediscover what's yeah. been forgotten. Yeah, or in the case of like a really passionate call, like like a, a Wesley, mm -hmm. that phenomenon has all the phenomena there, mm -hmm. and it's not driven by persecution. Although there was some from the religious mm -hmm. kind of elite, but nothing death defying. But it definitely is uh, the same phenomenon. So uh, we say that there's two types of um, uh, adaptive challenges, adapt or die. Mm -hmm. That's China, right? Mm -hmm. They either adapt or they disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, or compelling opportunity. So mm -hmm. the food's better in the next valley. It's a good reason to move. Mm -hmm. um, you know, go get it. And I think actually in our day we're experiencing both. Mm -hmm. There is a sense where the church in the West is is an adapt or die scenario. If you mm -hmm. look at Europe and mm -hmm. my country, mm -hmm. uh, there's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. And it's coming, right? So that's a reason to change. But there is also a wonderful opportunity in our day, honestly. Mm -hmm. I, th I think uh, it's wide open for us uh, to, to engage it. And I think that's a good reason to change as well. Now, um, uh, your, your last thing is, has got me going in a different direction than what I w was planning to do, so I'm trying to decide what to do. Um, when, when we are in an adapt or die mode, um, how do – how do, there's a sense in which um, 
we live in a world in which most people don't even know what we're talking about. I mean, they're unchurched. It's what we call them states, the unchurched. People who've never darkened the door of a church, they don't know what a church is about, et cetera. Their values are formed. Uh, whatever they've come from, they has, the church has had little or nothing to do with it. Now, th this is one of the changes. We're back to the point I was making earlier. We've, we lose the Judeo-Christian veneer of our society, which informs the way people may have been shaped, even though they may have never walked into church. Um, and, and so something else is forming them. And now we've got this message. And I, part of what I'm hearing you say is, is the church has to adjust to the fact that that is our largest audience now. Yeah. Um, which changes the way you got to communicate because right. you can't assume. <laughs> I can't. I, uh, the way I like to say it, you can't assume they know Genesis from Malachi. I mean, <laughs> and, and Malachi from Shemelachi. Exactly either. right. So, <laughs> Who's so, Malachi? <laughs> that's right. So that's I mean, that, that's, those are all foreign words. Yeah. So, um, so, so how how does the church get into that place and into that world? Yeah. Well, you see, I mean, this this is why I think the missional conversation is is the one that actually uh, hosts the f the future of the Western Church. I mean, the the two thirds world is doing pretty well without us, but mm -hmm. uh, the Western Church's future, I think, is caught up somewhere in that umbrella of ideas that we put under the word missional, mm -hmm. uh, where we must now adopt a missionary stance in relationship to our context. We can no longer assume that we have the same language to communicate with each other meaningfully. And that I would say that all mission in Western context now is fundamentally, and you need to consider this, as fundamentally cross-cultural. Mm -hmm. That is, there are people who are culturally distant from us. Mm -hmm. There are people within our orbit, and in On The Verge we suggest this is 60-40 uh, mm -hmm. play, that there are about 40% of Americans that are within the orbit, culturally speaking, mm -hmm. of the church as we know it. Mm -hmm. And that we should fish in that pool there's mm -hmm. no, no question that, mm -hmm. but we're all competing for the same p slice right, of the pie right it's that other 60 percent mm -hmm. that we need to be attentive to and uh that 60 percent is i mean comprising of muslims through to jews through to homosexuals and all the other stuff and subcultures all and the diversity cross -cultures. The, all the diversity and yeah. plurality yeah. that we see well every nation is is represented in this country exactly so we have a in most elementary schools yes and that locally that's oh the my point goodness, yeah. Yeah. So it's huge right yeah. so now, that is a different context, and right. we need to engage them on their turf. We're the sent ones, mm -hmm. and we go to them. So mm -hmm. th that our job is to communicate meaningfully on their terms. This mm -hmm. is incarnation, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a great challenge to us to kind of uh, move out of our comfort zones and learn again. This it's is a reversal again. of the arrow. I mean, sometimes yeah. we think, well, the way in which you do evangelism is you bring them to church, or you bring them to – you bring them – here. Well, yeah. in fact, what you're saying is, no, no, no. that's not going to work. The arrow's got to go the other yeah. direction. We've got to go there yeah. and go there with, with ears and understanding yeah. Yeah. and engagement. Yeah. This is obviously what I'm all about. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. And Engagement that, that, uh, that, that, that almost – and this is the trick, and this is the, what I think is hard for people – that immerses without being immersed. Yes. Okay? Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah. yeah. It holds on to essentials. Like, and that's yeah. why I say that Jesus is Lord. And there are some – I mean, I think the Bible provides us one – because that's the Bible's context, right? Exa absolutely. So actually, they're giving us tools – uh, that actually are much more consistent with our context now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can take our cue from, from how they engaged. And Paul, particularly, as he's the cross-cultural missionary, will teach us again. I mean, Paul in Athens is different, isn't he, to Paul in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. He's got his King James Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Versus there, he's interpreting the idolatry. Exactly. I, idols indicate what it, people think is meaningful. It's right. what they worship, right? Right. Uh, we say, I mean, it's an offense to God. But it's a clue to what they think is important. Mm -hmm. And I think analysis of people's idolatry is a clue to how you engage people. So say, I said already, you know, you go into context and the one thing you ask is what is church? But mm -hmm. actually more foundational is what is good news for this people group. Mm -hmm. Now, you cannot know that until you do some listening mm -hmm. and observing, like Paul does in Athens. That's right. You look at the idols, you look at the art forms where there's a struggle for meaning, a search for the ex existential search, a religious quest, interpret it, and you, 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 you kind of find the ways that the gospel makes a connection with that piece. And what I think is interesting about, about the New Testament situation that, that I think we are going back to is, is that the church at the time was, wasn't just a minority. It was a, it was a, it was a minuscule, minuscule minority. I mean, it was, in terms of the 
percentage of total population next to nothing, and yet they were able to establish who they were in their identity and engage the culture in such a way that they became attractional in both positive and negative ways because part of what created the persecution is some people got what they were saying yeah. didn't want anything to do yeah. with it. Yeah. Yeah. And other people got what they were saying and yeah. said, that's different, I want a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the quality of life, the embodiment of the gospel, the, 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 you know, the, the capacity to suffer well. And of course, Stark in his other book, um, uh, Taking the Cities for God, I think it's called, uh, talks about in the early church when uh, when all the pagans left Rome, when of course the two great plagues, we see a spurt of growth in the church. Mm-hmm. Well, that was funny. So, see, what you looked under the hood of what was going on there, you discovered this is that the pagans took to the hills, abandoning their sick. The Christians stayed in, in town to look after the sick. Many of them died, actually. The pagans come back and say, What kind of people are these mm-hmm. that stay and look after our sick? And I mean, of course, the church experiences uh, a, a radical, you know you know influx into the church as a result there seems to be something that kind of witnessing community that alternative society idea is is really where we we have to recover that uh, at the moment most people look and most indicators say we're not fundamentally different in our divorce rates mm-hmm. our adulteries and all that stuff to the world around about us and this is why discipleship becomes a fundamental thing is that that's where we raise the bar and what it means. So to if we Jesus. look like we're just an option among many, and there really isn't much difference between yeah. them, then who's who's attracted? Well, I'm saying like it's you know well, why would I bother? It just seems a lot more hard work, and yeah. there's some nasty people around there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hang out with those guys. Like, the pub is a much more friendly place. Yeah. Sometimes, so. Well, I'm gonna shift gears here and, and, and take a moment. I don't normally do this, but I think it's important for this particular topic. I want you to address church leaders a little bit, pastors, people who are thinking about that, people who are charged with the responsibility of leading organizations and maybe thinking about this shift, but they go, okay, um, I mean, obviously we're recommending some of the stuff that you've talked about to get people's thinking in this regard, but here's the question that I think I have. You know, most church leaders have studied theology, but they haven't studied culture or sociology, or what you have called phenomenology. Yeah. We, 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 we don't do that, generally speaking. So if, if a person were to say, all right, I want to learn how to get under the hood. Uh, I, I want to wh- – what would – what recommendations would you give them for how to become a student of culture, how to become a student of – uh, of sociology, what, how to create the categories for them to begin to think in these ways? What, what would wow, you that's an interesting question. Um, I think partly it's it's uh, it's reading outside of our our, our um, I mean having good education. I, I actually think that uh, sociology. I'm not a trained sociologist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm not even trained phenomenologist. I think I'm ADD enough. <laughs> just, you ooh, just absorbed the, it all. The pretty, the yeah. pretty patterns. Yeah, I'm ADD too, so I'll, I'll, I understand your guilt. But, Go ahead. <laughs> but actually, no, yeah. ADD, ADD is predictive thinking. That's it's right. kind of, so I can see patterns. Uh-huh. Now, having said that, I, I, I now know what it is, and I've tried to kind of get to, get to grips with it. But I try and read outside of my disciplines that I mm-hmm. normally would have, you know, I'm comfortable in theology and I love it. Uh, but it's uh, important to read people who maybe I sometimes disagree with, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, but in actually engaging them, I actually learn why I actually believe. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I find that very invigorating. Um, And then just the other thing is is what we say is uh, the listening process um, uh, in culture. Uh, leaving suspending our judgments. Again, like I said, one Mm -hmm. of I think I think the biggest clues uh, to to people's hearts mm-hmm. and to, to what they think is important and to their spirituality is their idolatry, mm-hmm. which is their false worship. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, if we looked at it from purely a kind of prophetic edge, and then we'll have to judge it, right? Mm-hmm. Because God judges it. Yeah, it's just wrong, it's yeah. sin. Yeah, so we actually, yeah. but actually, uh, uh, G.K. Chesterton said that a man knocking on the door of a brothel is looking for God. Mm-hmm. Chesterton, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Lewis says that all. Uh, all our vices of virtues gone wrong. Mm-hmm. And I think we need to learn that. We need to kind of observe that people's sins are clues to what they're looking for. It's looking for the right thing in the wrong places. Mm-hmm. Don't judge it so much as look into it and see how the gospel addresses it. Yeah. Why, 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 it. why would someone go there yeah. versus the gospel? Yeah, kind that's of thing. right. Yeah. So I think we need to uh, and be attentive to uh, the subtext that mm-hmm. goes on. Movies are great clues to this. Oh, no, uh, absolutely. And I think learn to you know exegete a movie and what's really being said underneath the mm-hmm. movie. Uh, talk about it with brothers and sisters, but also talk about it with non-Christian people. Say, well, what did you get out of that movie? Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because I think 
Most of that is about mythos and mythos uh, story. Uh, our most fundamental stories tell us a huge amount of information about what people think. Yeah, I did a series of podcasts with Reg Grant, who does media arts here, and we were talking about this uh, as as um, you know that there are stories that drive people, and if you th- if you really look at movies now, I mean, some movies are just raw escapism; they yeah, just want to yeah. pull you out of. That's not what yeah, we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, we're talking I mean about the good the, ones. We're know. talking about the ones that really yeah. cause people to sit and think about life. Yeah, yeah. and uh, if you if you you uh, examine them and assess them and deconstruct them, then you see why is it that people are drawn to this? What is it about the story that that uh, that draws? I, I'm, I'm thinking of the movie that won the Academy Award this year. I think for foreign film, which I haven't seen, but which I've, I have an interest in seeing. I think it's about an old couple in which one of the people has Alzheimer's, and the, mm-hmm. and the whole story is about the beauty of caring for someone who is deteriorating yeah. in their, and, yeah. and facing their mortality. And, and it touched a nerve. And the human condition is exactly. It not? And our empathy, our com- capacity to empathize with other human beings in their suffering and in their loves and in their brokenness and in their search and in their longing. I mean, I think this is what I love about Jesus, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think, honestly, I think Jesus gets right to the issues very quickly. The woman at the well, for Mm -hmm. instance. I mean, you know, she's trying to find identity in men. I mean, she's had Mm -hmm. a number of, and Mm -hmm. she's got another one, you know, So, Mm -hmm. and here she is, like, flirting with him. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, I mean, he addresses her real need, but he looks beyond what is appearing Mm -hmm. to what is really being done. And I think all human beings long for meaning, and I think uh, long for connection, and ultimately, and this is the Augustinian view, our hearts are uh, one vast. We're one heart, vast yearning for God, mm-hmm. but we look for it in the wrong he made places. Made in His yeah. image, yeah. so it makes sense that we would seek uh, Him. Our hearts are restless yeah. until they find their rest in God. Yeah. Well, I, I think that I think this is important. I, I, I what I like to I often say, we do a pretty good job of teaching people how to go from the Bible to life, but we don't do such a good job of going from life to the Bible. And to be able to switch hit as a church leader is actually very, very oh, important. Huge. Huge. And so, and and so, moving from where the life Life is where the culture is, what it's doing, and being able to not only ass- we're not just talking about assessing that, pointing the finger and saying, "Oh, that's right" or "That's wrong," that's sin, but understanding what's motivating and driving that. Well, how yeah. does that work, and how do you get into that mechanism and kind of pull it apart and say, "That's not the only way to put this together," and that's mm. not the only direction to go. Yeah, it seems to me is at the core of being a good leader. Yeah, I think so. Uh, even learning what we mean by evangelism, um, you know. I think it was Epictetus, the philosopher, who said it is impossible to teach a man what he thinks he already knows. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of our actually learning involves, first of all, unlearning. And uh, just the assumptions we bring to things um, might not necessarily be the biblical ones. We just assume they're right. You know? and okay, re- well, we're running re-learning again. real tight for time here, so I need to sit down and figure out what's the last thing I want to <laughs> ask you. Um, uh, um. Uh, here, here's one. You, you, at one point, you dealt with five questions um, to assess what's going on. It's kind of a, a shame that we're at the end, and I'm getting to this. But, and they are: What are we doing? Why are we doing it? How are we doing it? When are we successful? And where is God taking us? I think those are great questions to ask. Yeah. I really don't have anything to ask about them because they're so clear and such a good list. But it struck me in reading this that there's one that I thought that could be added, and I wanted to get your comment on it. And it was, this, should we be doing this? And if not, then what? Okay. In other words, sometimes when I do an assess, what I see churches doing sometimes is they add programs. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is good. This is why we do it. It's really great. And 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 what happens is the church multiplies its programs, yeah. but then it, in, in ad, it's got limited resources, yeah. and so in adding its programs and it's stretching wider and wider and wider, it gets thinner and thinner yeah, as yeah, it yeah. does that That's unless right. things go. Yeah. So I suspect that part of change is making that assessment. Yeah. Is that is yes? It? Uh, I think it was uh, no, it was uh, Peter Senji, the guy who kind of came up with the thing called uh, learning systems, learning theory, learning organizations, mm-hmm. as you call it. Um, wonderful man. Um, he said this. Uh, he says, L. You got to think about this as a kind of L mm-hmm. equals P plus Q. Okay. Learning takes place when programming is subjected to questioning. Okay. And he says it's the kind of questions you ask that lead you on the learning journey. So mm-hmm. it'd be, be the, the, quest, the question leads on a quest. Mm-hmm. And that if you ask it well and, and do some depth questioning, actually that's how learning takes place. So it's, it's critiquing what we currently do. Why mm-hmm. do we do it? Mm-hmm. 
I mean, sometimes people don't really know. Yeah. Well, because we've we always do done it because we've way. always done it. Yeah. Exactly. Or yeah. somehow the tradition has told us to do it. Well, yeah. you know, you're letting the tradition do your thinking for you. And uh, I mean, if if uh, and this is all of us. I mean, you can I can you mm-hmm. can pick on any of our traditions, but if you think Calvin, mm-hmm. who was working out his stuff in the 16th century, mm-hmm. can guide you into the 21st globalized context as a simple kind of formula Mm -hmm. I don't think so Mm -hmm. and that's what we call is the cedia Mm -hmm. Uh, it's sloth Mm -hmm. you're allowing other people in different eras and times to do your thinking for you Mm -hmm. you have to and particularly in a time of crisis where we find the church has to really get to the core of things we have to ask the right questions and go on a quest again and it's not it's all right. it's Mm -hmm. all right to question there's nothing sacred about our forms and the things that we do uh, we can always do it better and let's go on a quest and we, find we, out. We know how this works. I mean, I've, you, I've, I'm sure, have been in meetings. Where I know I have where, I, where you ask, why do we do this? And what you get is the history. In the beginning, <laughs> there was this. <laughs> and God said. <laughs> exactly. And we did this. And then you go. But we imply yeah, the God said. That's piece right. of it. But we're 20 years down the road yeah. now. Yeah. And the question is, do we still need yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. And uh, or, or did it meet a need for a time? And yeah. did so wonderfully. Yeah. And people yeah. were blessed. But, Let it but go. it's time. Time is, is, is passed. Yeah. Those are hard decisions to yeah. make yeah. Um, uh, because people become invested in their identity through the various programs that they associate yeah. with when they come attached to ministry. You love this one, right? Yeah. Down. It's hard to get a man to understand something when their salary depends on their not understanding it. <laughs> 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 so, so, yeah. so, actually, so many of the things we do, the ones that actually hold it are actually so invested that it, it that it's. It's very hard to ask questions of the very thing that you've vested in, right. but yet actually some of our deepest learning might take place in that. And, and, uh, and the way I like to talk about this when I talk about change is, is that when you deal with change, people always initially feel you're taking something that's important yeah. away from them. Yeah. So they feel, they feel robbed, yeah. if I can say it that way. That's the emotion. So that when you introduce change and you're introducing the vision for change, it's very, very important to tell them what you are giving them and what they are gaining by the move so they're willing to think about the exchange. Because yeah. if you don't get them to the point where they're willing to think about the exchange, they're holding on. Yeah, they are. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the, um, I mean, uh, the, um, having a bigger why, mm-hmm. you know, having a, giving a bigger reason mm-hmm. than the current ones we have, I think is – and this is where I think good theology works for us, you know. Um, you know, uh, of um, communicating in such a way we can, you know, we we can ask questions. It's a prophetic call to ask questions, but we also then go on a quest for learning, which is the apostolic alternative. And uh, uh, but I think communicating in a way that people can really connect their hearts with it. I think it's a challenge, but I think it's leaders have got to do that stuff. Well, um, I'm, I'm, t- I'm wrestling with a pun here. I think we've gotten on the verge of our topic <laughs> and uh, 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 thinking about the missional church and what's involved in the dy- dynamics of it. And I really do thank you, Alan, for taking the time to talk with us about this. I hope this has stimulated you in thinking about um, the issues associated with missional church. And I really do hope that you uh, have benefited from our conversation. We thank you for joining us at the table where we discuss issues of God and culture. And today we discuss the mission church and our hope is is that you will have been encouraged to become more missional as a result cheers thanks for listening to the table podcast dallas theological seminary teach truth love well